First scripture this morning is found in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we claim, wrong verse. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Second scripture is Re D uh, Revelation 21, chapter, uh, verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. I'm going to borrow one of these. Hope no one minds. Hope that chair doesn't get too lonely. Well, good morning. morning. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Jason Whitley. I am the son of Denise and Norman. Most of your faces I recognize, but in case you don't, that's who I am. Uh, recently, I've been spending my last two years up in Michigan studying at Andrews University to get my Master's of Divinity. And while I have been there, I have had a lot of friends that we have started a new tradition, I guess, where on Sunday nights, sometimes Saturday nights, my friends and I like to go out to an Olive Garden or Red Robin to have something that is a little bit different on our menu than what we normally cook up on a pitiful college tuition. And while I've been out there, I've come to realize that those companies, Red Robin, Applebee's, Olive Garden, all these guys, they are marketing geniuses. Hear me out. We go in and, you know, they give us the seat. And before I recognized that we would sit down and the menu would be there right in front of us and there would be an, you know, an insurmountable amount of options that you could choose from. And then on the side, they have the drinks as your options. They have all the appetizers, but they all sit in the corner. I've realized recently that they now have these monitors that sit right next to where the waiter is. And these monitors are constantly flashing these appetizers and drinks and desserts and they're just sitting there just doo -doo. look at that delicious fudge look at this volcanic sunday thing i don't even know what it's made of but it looks fantastic and the amazing thing that they do about this is that they do it while you're waiting so you're sitting there looking at your menu thinking i want something to eat they've minimized the actual content on the menu but the appetizers are just sitting there, just in your face, like, eat me, I am delicious. And you just like, oh, no, I, I shouldn't order those because I just want to look at what's on the main menu, but it's daunting you, saying, just take me, take a whisk. And then one of the things I noticed, I don't know if they do this here, but in Michigan, as they do the appetizers, but as soon as you actually order the menu, the pictures switch to desserts. I don't know if you have seen that, but they switch so that once you've actually ordered the menu, while you're still hungry, that dessert is looking at you so that you are constantly sitting there thinking, hmm, should I save room for this? And it, the amazing thing also is on the monitor, they don't show you the price. Deceivers. And this is something that I've come to notice. For me, like, I see that temptation there to constantly say, ah, oh, it doesn't really matter. It's just one dessert. What's it going to do to me? And this is something that has really impacted our lives and societies today. Because today we live in a society that is bombarded by advertisements that claim we need the newest, the fastest, and the smartest things. An individual is allowed to take what gives off instant satisfaction. Patience is gone and temptation is thriving. These changes in society affect how we react around the holidays, especially New Year's. Resolutions have always been a tradition for New Year's, yet recently people make re don't make resolutions anymore. In fact, if they do, what they planned on achieving slowly fades away till it is nothing more than a shadow 
in the dark alleys of our minds. We have made a mockery, actually, out of these fresh start ideas. Many of my friends have posted jokes online saying that they will remain the same punk at 12.01 as they were at 11.59. What is it that causes people to lose interest in changing habits? To have a fresh start. Today we're going to discuss some issues that prevent us from overcoming our old habits and the promises that God has given us about having a fresh start. But before we get in that, into that, I want to invite God to be with us so that He may show us something new today. Let's bow our heads. Father God, I thank you for this day and I thank you for this opportunity to be able to talk with not only my colleagues, but my friends. I pray that uh, as we dive into your word and to the message that you have prepared for us today, that you may guide us and teach us and mold us into what you want us to become. May this be by your will and by your love in our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first thing that I want to talk about is what actually prevents us from changing. I know that I have given sermons before on the New Year's and we have talked about this transformation and about this change when it comes to the new year. But the reality is, is that every single year, no matter what, it seems like we last a couple days, a couple, not even a couple weeks, maybe one, two. And whatever we said that we wanted to do is out the window. You know, uh, I was actually talking to my dad and he talked about some of his friends uh, at the Rose Parade that were making resolutions that were just not even possible. You know, like a woman who's 85, 87 or something that says, I want to go and run a marathon. Well, yeah, it's, it's possible, I guess. Kind of thing. So, you know, these, these jokes that are going around that says that, yeah, oh, yeah, I'll change whatever. Like this year, I don't even think I made resolutions. It's just not in my book. And so there is obviously something that sits in the back of our mind that says, well, why should I even try? Why should I do this? So there are three things that I want to say that I believe prevents us from actually making this change. And obviously there are more than three, but I want to keep it simple so that we remember these. So the first one that I've come to realize is that we don't actually have a plan. When it comes to it and people say, oh, what are your resolutions? What are you planning to do? Normally I'm thinking of it in that moment. I have no actual plan no decision that I have made to say that I actually want to change. I'm just saying, oh, well, um, I would like to eat healthier. Okay, but no plan has actually been made to prevent me from doing what I previously did. If I want to cut back on something, want to stop a bad habit in my life, I normally don't actually prepare anything in advance to stop me from doing this. So that's the number one problem. Number two. We don't actually remove ourselves from the temptation. Throughout this sermon, I'm going to give an example or an illustration of the temptation of a donut. Because a donut is something that is simple that we all can understand and you can put it in place with something in your mind that you know that you are tempted by without you feeling like I'm pinpointing or attacking you. So, a donut. A donut is delicious. At least I think so. I personally love Krispy Kremes and those delicious strawberry jelly filled ones. And so the donut in itself always looks delicious. And yet somehow we always put ourselves into situations or positions that we look directly into that donut. No matter where it is, you know, um, I asked my dad earlier this week, I was like, wow, I can't even believe that Dunkin' Donut is still alive. Apparently it is and it's still thriving. So, Dunkin' Donuts, who knew? But yet, you can still go in there and put yourself right in front of the donut and say, oh, well, now I'm in Dunkin' Donuts, I only want coffee. But you never go to Dunkin' Donuts just for coffee. You would go to Starbucks or something like that, but you still go to Dunkin' Donuts, even though you shouldn't. 
So we have these problems where we don't remove ourselves from the temptation. We constantly stay there. If I go into the grocery store and I say, I don't want donuts, how is it that I find myself in that aisle with all the desserts 10 minutes later? Hmm. The third problem that we have, and this is the one that really capitalizes on the previous two, is that we like what we were doing before more than what we are trying to do now. We like what we were doing before more than the new. If I want to change my habit, if I want to remove that temptation of the donut and live a healthier life, I try to tell myself, well, I must instead embark on the journey of eating only salads. A donut will never taste the same as a salad. No matter how many condiments or whatever I put on it, that salad will never be a donut. And yet somehow I want that donut more than I want the salad. And that is for most of us when it comes into some sort of temptation or bad habit is that we desire what we had before more than what we are trying to change. Like I said before, today we live in a society where we want that instant satisfaction. I know when I bite into that donut that it is going to taste fantastic. But when I bite into the salad, it doesn't necessarily taste as good, but I know the long-lasting result will be rewarding. And that are th is three of the problems that we have today. Now, notice something wrong with all three of these. Is that even if we do come up with a plan, we try to remove ourselves from it, we still don't like it more than the other. But the problem that I mentioned of all three of these is that God has not been at the center of it. Every single one of them that I presented to you is a problem. We need a plan. We have a, we need a purpose. We need to remove ourselves from it. God is not there in it. Most of the times when we set up a resolution, a plan or a habit, of something that we want to overcome, we try to do it ourselves. I myself included, even though I try to be, you know, a pastor studying in the seminary, I still find myself in these situations where I try to do everything on my own. And I don't actually go to God to try to help me with this situation. I just say, well, I can take it. I'm a responsible adult. I'm a grown man. I can do this. And I find myself falling flat on my face. I'm sure that many of you have also experienced something like that. So, what do we do with this, with this temptation, with this problem? How does it, what does it look like when God is in the center? I invite you to open with me in your Bibles or to your phone apps to the book of Matthew. And we're going to be looking at Jesus when he was tempted in the wilderness by Satan to see how he overcame these temptations and overcame, well, Jesus didn't have bad habits, but it can be an example for us on how to deal with bad habits and temptations. So Matthew chapter 4. Also recognize that this is found in the book of Luke, also Luke chapter 4, but the story is told in a different order. And many scholars and commentators believe that this is not the appropriate order in Luke, so we are going with Matthew. Mark also mentions it, but he literally just mentions it. It's one verse that says that Jesus went into the wilderness and was tempted by the tempter. So we're not going to Mark either. So Matthew chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 1, and we're going to go down to verse 4. And it says... Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Then Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Okay, so Jesus withstood one temptation. The first thing that we must know about this story is what just happened right before. 
Jesus did not only just walk into the wilderness and start this, he was just baptized by John the Baptist. How many of you who have been baptized actually remember when you were baptized? You kind of remember that surreal feeling right before you went in, and when you came out that said, like, I'm going to change, I'm going to make a difference. You know, that, that feeling that says that I am, I am new, I'm a different person, yet somehow, like two weeks later, you're like, wait, what happened? Jesus just got baptized. Jesus is now filled with the Holy Spirit and has God with him and goes out in the desert to spend 40 days alone with God. So Jesus has spent a lot, a lot, a lot of time with God. And he comes to this point where, where Satan is standing right in front of him and tells him to take the stones and turn them into bread. The temptation here is for man's desire. For Jesus is 100% man, 100% divine. This is tempting Jesus with the temptations of the world. If you're really hungry, why don't you just do it? You're strong enough to do this. If you really are the Son of God, just do it. There's nothing that prevents him from doing it, but there is a temptation in it for Jesus. Because he is no longer dependent on God. He becomes dependent on himself. How many times have we done this on our own? We know this where all of a sudden we take matters into our own hands and we forget that God's even there. And try to do things on our own. Here, Jesus stands against it and says that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So the main thing that we can take out of the first temptation is that God, blah, 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 sorry, <laughs> uh, we need to conclude that Jesus spent time with God and was filled with the Holy Spirit. That is the first thing that we need to take out of this first temptation. So let's look at the second. The second temptation is Matthew 4, verses 5 through 7. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, and you will not strike your foot against the stone. Then Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Satan is doing two things here. Two things to try to trap Jesus. Number one is presumption which I thought was interesting. I actually had to do a lot of research on presumption. And the second is the battle of Scripture. Notice in the first one, I actually had to ask my dad about this just because I have questions and my dad is the go-to guru on that. When it comes to this situation, he is telling Jesus, if you are the Son of Man, why don't you just throw yourself off? God can do it. It's not a problem. And I've thought in my mind, you know, if end times came and all, and I was put in the worst situation where I had to do something to stand up and say, if God's strong enough, why don't you take a bullet or whatever, you know, some bizarre situation. And when I see that, I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that I would be able to say, all right, God, I'm doing my part. You do yours. But here it's actually put as a sin because Jesus is not doing the will of God. He is making God do his will. And that's the problem of presumption. So the reason that I say that I went to my dad is I asked him, what's the difference between this and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? When they're about to go into the fiery furnace, they say something different. They don't actually say, I know God will provide for me. They actually say that I know that God has the power to provide for me. And if we die, we still will not bow to you. So there is a difference between these two. Satan is trying to trap with the presumption that God will abide by my will, not me working in God's will. 
So that's a very uh, tricky trap there. The second part that he is trapping him with is Scripture itself. In the first temptation, he comes to Jesus and says, you know, why don't you just eat this bread? It's no big deal. And Jesus answers with Scripture. So Satan comes back and says, oh, you want to battle with Scripture? Let me show you Scripture. And goes to a verse in Psalms. I believe it's uh, Psalms 91, verse 11 and 12. And he tells him, the angels will catch you. They will provide for you. So he's doing two traps in one. Dangerous. Dangerous, dangerous. Yet in this, Jesus is able to stand firm and still say, do not put the Lord your God to the test, which is Deuteronomy 6, 16. So what does this show us that is different than the one before? This shows us that to stand firm from old habits and temptations, we need a foundation in Scripture. We need a foundation in Scripture. So the first one shows we need God in the center of our lives. The second one shows that we need to be strongly rooted in Scripture. Okie dokie. So the third one, the third temptation is Matthew uh, 4, 8 through 11. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All of this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. This is without a doubt for Jesus the most difficult temptation of them all. Because Jesus already knows that he has come down to the earth to give up his life for us. He already knows that he has to go through intense pain and suffering for us. It's written in prophecies for him. He already knows the scriptures, so he knows this is going to happen. And Satan is giving him a way out. He comes up to him and says, dude, just get, just worship me. I will give you everything. All that you are fighting for, all that you have come on to this earth for, I will give it to you. You just bow to me. Give me authority and you can have your children. You can have your little lambs. I don't care. That is the temptation for Jesus. And this is something that goes against everything that he has stood for. All of the love that he has tried to bestow upon us, all of that instantly would just move aside so that he could be with us. But the problem is if there's no salvation, there's no salvation in this. So that's the problem that bestows upon this, and it's a sin to worship someone else. So Jesus has to take the biggest step to decline instant satisfaction, instant results, and go through the mud, the muck, the spitting, flame, and death so that we can live. And he chose that. So these are the three temptations. And what does the third one show us? Well, the third one shows us that Jesus was prepared. He was prepared to be tempted. Hear me out on this one. When you look at all three, all three of them, he had to have God on his side, and he had to be well-versed in Scripture. All of this means that before he even got into the wilderness, he had to be prepared knowing, I am going to be tempted. At some point, someone's going to come and try to stop me from what I am doing. Most of the time when it comes to us, and we think, I want to conquer something, even if we do come up with a plan, we come up with something, we are not prepared of what happens when we face that donut. When it's actually in our face, we don't think that far. We think of before we get there. But we don't think about what happens when we actually get there. Jesus had to think in advance, what am I going to do when I am tempted? And he was able to stand firm through it. This also shows us, by looking at Jesus' temptation, that we can see that being tempted is not a sin. Being tempted is not a sin. 
If someone comes up and tries to show you something that you are interested in, even though you know that the action is bad, being tempted is not the sin, because we know Jesus was tempted. But this also shows us, through Jesus' example, that no temptation is irresistible. There is nothing that we can do that actually is impossible for us. For Jesus withstood the strongest temptations and did not crumble. So that is hope for us, knowing that as we can see Jesus' example, we know that even though there are temptations, trials, troubles in our lives, no matter what, that sin is not irresistible. Well, that's great, Jason. Thank you. But how does this help me now? How does this impact my life so that when I get out, I can make a difference, I can make a change? Well, there are three promises. There's a lot of threes today. Three promises that God has given us that will help us in making changes. The first one is possibly the most popular of verses when it comes to changing or making your life new. And that is 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. I won't force you to look for it because I'll probably be done by the time you find it. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And then in verse 18 through 20, it also says, For this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciled, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sin against him, as he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. I like 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, the old is gone, and the new has come. I really like that verse, because it's a promise to us. When we look at the habits and we see what Jesus went through, when he says that it had, he had God and the Holy Spirit in the center of his life, he was well versed in the scriptures, he was prepared to be tempted, all of this is what it's like to stand firm when you have Christ in your life. And looking at this, if we have Christ in the center of our lives, we are a new creation because what we were doing before is no longer part of our lives. Now that does not say that the things that are desirable will leave. Because the temptation is not a sin. The temptation always exists. The part is to remove yourself from it. Now I will not say that that's an easy task. I'm not going to say go and do it right now. Because I can't even promise that I will be able to do it. But that's part of the process of starting. Is admitting that there is room for change. And then starting a plan to make that change. So now you're like, okay, thanks, Jason. Thanks for that promise. But what happens if I fail? What happens if I mess up? Yes, grace. My dad read the scripture reading today, and the first one was 1 John 1 9. In 1 John 1 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So you have these bad habits. We try to make the new, uh, we try to do the New Year's resolutions. We try to break the old, come in with the new. And do you know how long it takes to start a new habit? 21. 21. Do you know how many days it takes? in those 21 to break it one <laughs> yeah one minute one second the minute that that decision is made it's gone so 21 and then 21 days to start a new habit and one to break so if we start this new habit we fall in between it's not the end of the world first john 1 9 actually says you know if we make bad habits, it's not the end of the world. We don't only get one attempt to make things right. God has given us multiple opportunities. He's given us grace 
that even if we make a mistake, we have an opportunity to make things right. And the last promise that I want to give you guys was found in Revelation 21.4. Because the reality is, is God has given us grace. And we have multiple opportunities here to try to make a difference, to try to change. But the biggest hope and promise that God has given us is that there will be a day where we don't have to worry about that at all. In Revelation 21, verse 4, he says, You will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain. For the old order of things have passed away. We know that when we go to heaven, there is a promise that there will be no pain, that there will be no tears, that these troubles, these habits that we have in us, that we hate about ourselves, yet we go around the world pretending like they don't exist, those habits, those temptations will be gone. Every tear that falls from our face, all the pain that we cause ourselves and that we cause others will no longer exist. And that is a beautiful promise that God has given us. So today, even though we live in a society that is bombarded with advertisements that claim that we need the newest, the fastest, and the smartest things, and that we live in a society that tells us that we need instant satisfaction, even though patience is gone and temptation is thriving, and this affects how we look at our holidays, we don't need to look at New Year's as a day of mockery and a day where we laugh about the things that we cannot accomplish. Today we can look at it with a fresh start. We can know that if we stay faithful to God and keep Him true to our hearts, that these changes that we want to make in our lives will not be a shadow that hangs in the alleys of our minds, but that this can be something true and that we can move forward and be a new creation in Christ. This is a promise that He has given to us and something that we can cling on to. And something as we move on throughout our day, throughout this month, throughout this year, as a promise that we always have a fresh start.